I've learned over the years that we shouldn't get frustrated when we get to procurement. This is a positive thing. We're in negotiation, which is which is good. One of the things that I always try to do is start with yes and start with a open mindset to what, what's going to be discussed. I used to be like really stern and no, 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 that's not happening. <laughs> and I thought it was the right thing to do. But I think, yes, yeah, sure, don't be too soft in your stance, be firm, but be open to where this discussion is going. My name's Mike Lander, and you're listening to Higgle, the B2B Sales Club podcast, where we bring you actionable insights about sales RFPs, negotiations, and difficult procurement discussions from sales leaders, brand leaders, and procurement leaders. Please subscribe to get updates when new episodes are released. Chris, thanks ever so much for joining us on Higgle, the B2B Sales Club podcast. Delighted that you're here. Thanks for having me, Mike. So, um, first of all, a bit of background about yourself. Uh, obviously, what do you do? Who do you work for? Uh, and then if you can, something slightly unusual about yourself that people wouldn't know. Excellent. Yeah, I'm happy to kick off with that. So, so my name is Chris Tay. I am the Managing Director at Crowd in New York. I have been with the Crowd business actually for 12 years now. So I started off when there were only five people in the business back in the UK, down in Shoreditch, um, moved over to New York in 2015. And, and now we have over 500 people in the business, um, about, 100, yeah, about 100 in New York. So one of those great you know, stories of, That's amazing of story. a few people up, up to 500 and, and experiencing it all. And, and I, I still love it here. Um, so as part of that, I've been a sales professional for that whole time, to be honest. Um, and I went traveling around the world for a year back in 2008. Um, and when I got back, I, I just inherently knew that I wanted to get into sales. And I didn't know what kind of sales. And it was internet sales. So, that, so right. that's how it all started. And I started selling some SEO. Uh, okay. And I, I was blown away by how Google worked. And that's the um, the rest is history. Yep. Um, and, and I think my my sto- my interesting uh, fact about myself is is very related as well. So there's probably two things. I, I used to be very very shy as a kid, very no, um, so introvert. Like, didn't yeah. you know? I, I didn't didn't like go into group conversations easily, and and you know you you would think that's very weird for a salesperson. But a um, couple of things. So. The first thing I'd attribute to that is, is university and standing up in front of massive lecture halls and having to present and being so scared, yeah. but building the confidence for that. And the second thing, which is an interesting fact, and by the way, I could have said I am an endurance athlete here, right. but I used to be a butler in the buff. <laughs> <laughs> um, Say that, that again, is Chris. very scary. You, you were what? A butler in the buff. <laughs> so... <laughs> That is incredibly scary. <laughs> um, that is walking into a room of people with not a lot on um, and serving cocktails uh, sober. <laughs> so so uh, that built a lot of confidence for me <laughs> in my career. Um, but there you go. Chris, I've never, I didn't even know it was a thing. That's brilliant. And thank you for being so open. Fantastic. That would build your confidence. That would definitely build your confidence. (laughs) So um, before we get into the questions, just, um, and don't spend too long, and and obviously you can't reveal everything about what happened, but when you went from five to 500 people, can you just like describe for kind of, you know, people listening, um, what were a couple of the big things that really accelerated that journey? Because that's a really unusual story. Most agencies don't get even close to that. Can you work out what, what it may have been? So it's a, that is a brilliant question. And just reflecting really quickly, the, I, I honestly think a lot of it is attributed to the mindset in this agency. Right. Um, you know, right from the founders being this kind of, we, we, we sort of like celebrate success for about three minutes. Right. And then we, and then we go, okay, what's next? Um, and, and, I, and I honestly think that is a massive part of it because um, you want people to work for you that are like that and you want people to understand the journey and the ambition that we have. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, a lot of people are not in that mindset and it's totally fine. And and you can only be in that mindset for a certain amount of time as well, right? Like, you, you know, you can't do that forever. No. Um, but I think that has been a lot of the the, the thing that I always think back to of, what, why, why do we keep going? And why do we, I was so ambitious to keep growing and delivering amazing work. 
Um, I think that, that honestly, in, in essence, is what it is. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, and it's not what I expected you to say at all. Uh, I thought it might be something about, oh, you know, we had these amazing clients <laughs> and there was an anchor and then they referred us. And No, actually, it's about a collective mindset. That's what makes the biggest difference. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. And, and one, of the, one last thing on, on my yeah. business is that every, everyone is a shareholder as well. So it just creates this um, mentality of ownership and mentality of we're, we're, in this, we're in it together and we're all going to benefit from it as well. Exactly. And then again, re- I think a really, really important point about collective ownership. So um, a few questions. So we've got kind of like another like kind of 20 minutes or so. Um, first question. Um, so are you seeing an increased number of RFPs? and less formal kind of client briefs uh, recently? And also, why do you think this is the case? Um, what do you do to kind of qualify those opportunities from the ones where you're just being used for benchmarking? Because you must get, you know, we get all these RFPs now, it's getting bigger, and, but some of them, they're not real. How do, you, how do you focus on the ones that you can really win? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So, so we all we always have a mix of the more casual briefs and the official RFPs. Um, and, Do you know and what the mix again, is, going Chris? Back to your question, just out of interest. I so in I've looked at the data just to back up what my my yeah. thought was, but it's slightly more in favour of those co- uh, client, um, uh, sorry, casual briefs. Okay, um, and. That's going back to the point that you sort of said around referrals and doing good work, and honestly, that that mentality of always being out there and trying to build conversations and relationships in this business. Yeah. So we always get that level. The, the challenge with those is they're very hard to predict. Yes. It's really hard to predict how many when they're coming. You know, you sometimes get a lot, you sometimes get none. Um, but it's probably sixty forty percent, right? In terms of um, the forty percent being the official RFPs. Um, yep. And the challenge with the casual ones, uh, both, I guess, is that are they, are they real? Like, are they just exactly. getting a price, wasting our time? Um, and how do we qualify them? So great question. And, and over the years, we've got a lot better at this. And, and I actually want to um, give some credit to so a guy called Blair Enns, who I know you know as ah, well. and no, Blair Enns, really well. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I attended a um, breakfast session with him in New York um, with a bunch yeah. of agency partners, um, and you know I, I hadn't read anything about him. I hadn't read his books, and it, it really, honestly, blew me away in terms of his approach to these kind of conversations. His approach to using pricing strategically, um, and we took. Some, I, I was honestly so inspired that I went back to the office, spent a whole morning just thinking about how we could apply that to our business. And I came up with something called um, crowd discovery, which is essentially uh, an antidote to this issue of how do we know that it's real? How do we understand the brief really well? And how do we stop people just wasting our time and ghosting on us? Exactly. So it's essentially a, a really good process where we look at media, we look at audience, we look at analytics, and we have a bunch of diagnostic things that we do. And previously, we used to do this all free. Always free. Yeah. Please, please let us pitch for your business. Um, and now we outline the fact that this is very, very important and hard work to do, and it takes time. Yeah. Um, and there is a cost behind it. So we don't pitch anything for free. We'll we'll do this um, diagnostic uh, analysis for you. Um, and at the end of it, you know, if you're happy, you'll pay us this money. If you're not happy, take it away and um, uh, go 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 on go on with yourself. Um, so it's been really really good to just put that marker there. Like, yeah, we're absolutely happy to do this. It costs money. Um, but, you know, what do you what do you think? Yeah. And the objective is so that it it makes the brands pause and go, oh, yes, we actually really do want to work with the crowd, but mm, yeah. maybe we're not willing to pay that, or, or sure, we're willing to pay that. And for me, it's to make sure that. Um, the power and the choices in our hands if we want to work with these people, these brands, not, oh yeah, sure, just give us all of this stuff for free and we exactly. might tell you if we want to work with you. Correct. Because they might just be simply benchmarking or they might just be someone internally has said, well, you know, what's going on in the marketplace and, oh, have we spoken to Crowd recently? No, we haven't. Well, let's ask them a load of questions and see what they, see what they come back with, see what insights they've got. Yeah. It's not, they're not real opportunities. Yeah. 
and we've all wasted so much time on non-real opportunities. We don't you know in sales we're we're very optimistic. Uh, we think everything is an opportunity, and we, we get really excited when someone wants to speak to us. And over time, you realize very you know you realize that that they're not all opportunities, and we need to qualify them. Exactly. So, uh, next question, which leads on from that. Um, what are your three biggest reasons for losing RFPs or client briefs? And what can you do about it? So, good, good question. And again, I honestly feel like I'm learning all of the time here. Like every time we do something and get feedback, we, we're learning and we build it into the next um, process. But a few of the ones that, that we have won or not won recently have become been because of three things. Um, well, maybe more, but let's talk about three. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> not take, not, so answering the brief too literally, we used to be so good at that and we thought we were doing our job. Um, we'd, we'd you know, answer each question so detailed and, and exactly what we thought they wanted and be like, we did a great job on that. Surely we're going to win and we wouldn't win. <laughs> um, ah. So that's one thing. Not taking enough risks is the second thing. Um, yeah. You know, we, we've answered br- briefs brilliantly. We've been told that if this other agency didn't exist, you would have won. And I'm like, okay, so what did the other agency do? They didn't really answer the brief. They took a big risk on going down a route and answering a, um, a different question to what they were asking and, and won the business. Um, so that's definitely something we always take into mind. Do we have the two or three aha moments in this yeah. pitch? Um, and then the third thing is just not telling good stories. Uh-huh. Um, very, very good technical slides. Everything makes sense. The technical people in the room love it, but there's not a story t- pulling it all together. Um, and I think the challenge that agencies have here is that we often get asked to turn things around very fast. Yep. We have to pull mm-hmm. people in from various different teams and, um, uh, they're working on clients and we have to get to a really succinct story really quickly. And sometimes you have four or five people telling their own little story within a, within a presentation and not one story. So we work really hard on that now. So um, this, this, there's loads of questions here, Chris. So <laughs> first one is um, <laughs> of all of the things that you answer in a year, the briefs slightly less formal and the RFPs, how many of those are um, what I would call creative led? The client's looking for some kind of um, creative uh, materials. You know, it could be like a launch of a new brand, or it could be market entry, or it could be a relaunch. Um, but it's a creative-led exercise, which has media attached to it, versus those which are, I don't know, uh, shopper marketing, experiential, um, uh, SEO. Um, so what's the kind of, what's the mix? Because I think that matters in terms of what you've just said. Mm. So the mix has changed over time for us. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested to hear why you think that matters. Very interesting. <laughs> okay. so, but I'll answer, I'll answer first. Um, the mix has changed for us over the years because of um, the posi- our positioning in the market and the service offering that we had. So everything used to be very focused on performance media for us, which yes. was you know the searches, the socials, the programmatic displays, and the SEOs. Um, over the years, we've built the capabilities in um, a more integrated strategy and planning department, the data capabilities that every agency, of course, needs now. And the, the pitches that we are getting on are more brand and planning and, and this bigger media-led, which is, which is great for us. That's the position that we want to move to in the market. Um, we rarely get on pitches that are led with by creative, is what I say. Rarely. Ah, okay. So I was speaking to Gareth Turner, who was the ex-marketing director for Weetabix, um, and he's run, he ran loads of campaigns uh, and he's now independent uh, and runs his own business. But I was talking to him uh, and he said that um, when they run a creative pitch, for example, um, he doesn't want the agency to put in hundreds of person hours and nail the creative brief on day one, as in when they pitch. He said, that's not what I'm looking for. But what I am looking for is I'm looking to see how did they get to the answer they got to what kind of process did they use? And is there an essence there, Rob? I can see their creativity. So that's an example whereby, um, to your point, they may not have answered the exact same question on the creative brief. They answered a slightly tangential one, but you can see where their thinking's going. So the direction of travel is correct. Um, so I think that's interesting about when that's a creative-led. 
when it's not a creative-led pitch and it's more performance-based, for example, but at some scale, the reason I say I think it's different is um, I've got three things as an ex-buyer. So you know an ex-procurement director, Chris. So I was on the buy side yeah, yeah. when you were on the sell side. So I'd be writing this RFP and I'd be talking to the brand director <laughs> and I'd be creating the, 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 the RFP in some detail. What I don't write in there, what I don't write in there is this. So how I score it is put the creativity to one side for a second. First of all, did they understand the brief? Did you broadly answer the questions that we asked? So if you didn't answer the brief at all and didn't answer the questions, clearly that's going to go down badly. Let's assume you did. Yeah. So you broadly answer the right questions and you've definitely understood the brief. Then I'd say, okay, um, did they provide evidence against that? So when Chris says something, did he back it up with some data? Because if he didn't, it might just be a great story, but there's no evidence to back it up. So that gets you two thirds of the marks. The last third of the marks is, I think, what you just alluded to, which is, did you bring some challenge and some insight to our thinking? Because we may have got this brief wrong. We may be answering the wrong exam question because we set the wrong exam question. Because your knowledge yeah. of the sector and your knowledge of your capabilities is far greater than ours. And if you challenge, so if you answer the right questions broadly, understand the brief, you provide evidence base, and then you really challenge our thinking and answer a question we never asked in a way that we never thought about, now you're memorable, and now you've added real value. And now I'm thinking, crowd someone we need to follow up with in a bit more detail, because the stuff in here we just haven't thought about. Does that resonate? Sounds easy, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> it's so easy, Chris. I, uh, I don't know why one doesn't do it. I, yeah. <laughs> I know, no, it, it really, it really does, it really does resonate. And we've we've had all of that feedback before. You know, either doing one and not two, and doing three, and you've missed out on that. Well, you've not proved that you've done it before. Correct. Um, so yeah, it really does, it really does resonate. Um, and it, it just made me think back to Blair again on the um, on the on the piece about diagnosis. Like often yes. you get these briefs and it's just a brand self-diagnosing themselves. And Correct. we don't know if that's true yet. So no. that's why it's so important to do that kind of discovery and analysis. And um, the thing that I say to brands now is that if we do this discovery, we're going to be in a much better place than just guessing and answering your brief. And no one can argue with that. It's just whether or not they want to take the leap. Um, Correct. But yeah, it's great, 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 great feedback. I appreciate it. So something else, uh, Chris, so let's see if, Let's see if you agree with this or not. It, a, lot of, a lot of agencies don't. They think I'm a bit mad. Um, but um, my view of, of, of briefs is this. Um, brands, uh, like agencies, brands are short on time. Um, they're sometimes forced into processes that they may not want to run. Uh, and that was on one of Blair Enns' podcasts recently. Um, and uh, they write, therefore, the brief that comes out, it, it's not 100%. In fact, it's probably 75%. I believe agency's role is to enhance the brief. Your role in life is to tell me what I have not thought about and to um, expand the brief beyond where my thinking is and then kind of play that back to me to see if the enhancements are correct. The fact that an agency sits there and says, well, the brief was a bit rubbish, so that's why we didn't win. <laughs> I'm like, that's just wrong. That's just a cop out by agencies. What's your thought, Chris? <laughs> it's a genuine uh, statement. I last, genuinely believe it. So until the until the I agreed with you until the last thing you said, and then I was like, huh. It got, <laughs> it got my back up a little bit because so I think I, I I do agree with all of your principles. I think I agree with you like 90%. The the, right. the, the last 10% is the last 10% is um, yeah, obviously on the agency side, everyone's busy and we get these briefs in and we really want to do a good job of answering them. Make them good. Absolutely. That's, that's what I'd say. Make them good. And make, yeah. Uh, make, I, make the process nice. Make the process good and productive. Not not just the brief, but not just the brief, but what are the meetings? What are the chemistry thing? You know, sometimes you don't even hold a chemistry meeting and that that's not that's not good, right? And it's not respectful. 
It's not respectful. Yeah. And I think so. I think I think on a serious point, you're spot on, which is if you're gonna if a brand's gonna run a process to appoint an agency and they're genuine about you know appointing someone they've not worked with before rather than reappointing the incumbent. The only way, in my view, that's going to work is, for example, you have to have some kind of half hour, 45 minute hour meeting before you ever, ever put pen to paper or, you know, uh, hands to keyboards. Before you ever do that, if they won't give you an hour with the budget holder and the procurement person, if, if that's who's running it, that's a really bad sign. That's a really, really bad sign. Yeah. Because the, the idea that you can do your best work and <coughs> do the longer hours that's required to fill in the RFP and to uh, put in your best thinking, the idea you can do that off a piece of paper that I've written, not being the budget holder, and without you having mm. access to the people who are going to have to live with the outcome, is frankly ludicrous, I think. Yeah, yeah, ag agreed, agreed. But it happens a lot. Apparently, Chris, for some of the big brands, they're still saying, here's the RFP, you can't talk to anyone, um, best foot forward, and then when we decide to shortlist, yes, you'll sit in front of a panel. Well, that that's no good. That's not how to get the best work out of an agency. No, I actually, um, just I think earlier in the week, I was uh, listening to something from Tom Denford at uh, ID Comms, um, saying that like you know me media's become quite boring in the pitch process and you know right. it's all just very systematic and ai and bidding and, and he's just saying like bring, bring the humanity back to the process exactly. bring the chemistry bring the ca ca partnership and can we work together and the people back to the process and yeah i just couldn't agree more with that um that's what it's about correct and when we say partnership again you know a lot of agencies talk about having a partnership with the client the reality is a lot of it isn't a true partnership partnership to me is we're both taking some risk and some reward. We're both benefiting from a collaborative approach to solving a problem that's not been solved before. And there's benefit for both parties. And therefore, part of your fees are at risk. But if it goes well, there's a bonus. And for me, I'm making the investment, which may or may not pay off. And if it does, then, you know, we can win big. But that's about having, you know, an adult to adult conversation and, and, and sharing some risk together. I completely agree. I think the humanity is going out of the process. I think that's very sad. Yeah, agreed. I mean, that kind of brings us on to procurement. I don't, have we got time to yeah, we talk have. about procurement? Yeah, carry, no, we'd love to. Definitely, <laughs> definitely, Chris. Great. I always want to talk about procurement. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, I think like it would be good to just talk quickly about some of the some of the approaches that we take when we get to procurement. Um, you know, obviously... I've learned over the years that we shouldn't get frustrated when we get to procurement. This is a, it's a positive thing that, yeah. you know, we're in negotiation, which is, which is good. Um, and you know, I think one of the things that I always try to do is start with the S and start with a, a open mindset to what, what's going to be discussed. Um, not a very, and I used to do this. I used to be like really stern and no, 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 that's not happening. Right. <laughs> and I thought it was the right thing to do. Um, but I think, you know, yes, sure. Don't be too soft in your stance. Be, be firm, but 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 be open to where this discussion is going. Yeah. Um. And you know, t typically it's a good thing that some sometimes you get you think procurement are asking you fifteen things and and you've not been able to ask for anything back. But that's a really good thing in my mind, not a bad thing. Like, why do I say that? So it means that if if they're asking for like several different things, we can then have something to go back against them with. So if they need a fast start, we need a certain term. Yeah. If they need a discount, we need a longer term. If yeah. they need results fast, then we put skin in the game and get a bonus. And, and you know, just working on those things with them. And I think like gi giving, like give to get, right? Um, I'm very, very open now in my procurement discussions versus my younger self. So interestingly, I think a couple of things there. So I think uh, what you're describing to me is a trade. The, the negotiation is you're, you're very happy to um, give something, providing you get something in return. I think every procurement person you talk to would go, that's fair. Yeah. Um, just out of interest, kind of what, what difference has that made to the outcomes from, the, from those negotiations <coughs> over the years? As you've kind of matured as a negotiator, 
from when you started in sales to where you are now, very experienced commercial leader. Um, what's the difference in the kind of outcomes over the longer term? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. And I'll start it as firstly with the fact that so, sometimes procurement people tell you exactly what they need before you, before you've even kind of spoken. It's just like, I'm going to come and listen, guys, we need 20%. Um, go back and think what you can do. Yeah. And okay, great. We know, we know what they need. Sometimes it takes a lot of work to get there. And, and sometimes we're uh, negotiating with procurement people who, so, honestly don't know what they're buying yeah <laughs> and i don't know your thought on that but it's it's like yeah, really I can respond tough. to that yeah. um yeah so it's really tough and, and i think um yeah to, to your first question the outcomes of the outcomes have gotten better because I, I just understand some of the things that i can push and pull and some of the things that i can secure right it, whether it's longer contracts or, or, or different commitments yeah um, and over the years as well, we've got much more in tune to putting our fees up for, for, for performance and what that means and how, how we measure that. So when we think about performance fees, it's not always tied to like a metric within the performance marketing world. It's not, it's not like, oh, we're going to hit this cost per acquisition and you pay us extra money. It's more, it's more about like, are we delivering our promises? And are we upholding everything that we said we were going to do? Yes, there's revenue involved there, but really it's like the service and the responsiveness and the quality that we're doing. Um, and often we do it on a scorecard. We have like a quarterly right. scorecard. Um, the, the brand scores us on it. And if we are not meeting their expectations, we won't get paid some of the fee. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then that's, that's a very balanced, um, very fair. You asked a question about why sometimes procurement people that you meet don't know the subject matter that they're negotiating around. So, Do they actually know? So, uh, <laughs> one of the things that happens, uh, and I talk about this a lot with people, uh, is if you look at, um, let's say you're uh, dealing with a retailer, say. And in that retailer, this procurement person, they've been in procurement for 20 years. So they're seasoned procurement people. For the first 15 years of their life, they bought apples, potatoes, bananas, and milk, big categories. And every cent that they negotiate a better price on, given the volume they buy, makes a difference to the gross and net profit. So imagine if I spent 15 years in direct procurement and I want to become the regional chief procurement officer. Well, if I've never bought indirect goods and services, that's a bit of a problem because the CPO runs all of directs and indirects. So what you'll find sometimes is you meet someone who's been moved into marketing procurement. They've been in role for about six months. Uh, their track record is in direct goods and services. They're rounding their career before they move into a bigger role in the next three years. Well, so when you meet these people, they don't know a great deal about marketing procurement. Their natural tendencies are to go back to what they know, uh, and that tends to drive them down often unit price and cost rather than investment and package service. So I think part of it is an education process. And ideally, Chris, 18, very difficult to, to do in practice, but 18 months to two years before you negotiate with the procurement person, ideally you want a relationship with them. You want to add value to who they are, and you want to um, inform them about where the industry is going that you work in. And that way, when you get to meet with them and you get to negotiate with them, they're more likely to be receptive to your views. Difficult to do because if they're transitioning in their career, how do you spot if they're going to be moving into indirects from directs? But, you know, you can look at their career path and you can look at their postings and you can look at what they're talking about on LinkedIn and it gives you some clues. So that's why often, they seem a bit, wow, you, you're not 21 straight out of university, you're 40, but you don't seem to understand the category in detail. That's sometimes why. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. Really good advice, especially from just uh, um, noticing that, spotting it very quickly and, and being soft towards it. And the education side is, I think, a really, really yeah. strong approach. Like if you can make them better in their job and their career. Not, exactly. Not, um, you know, not in a like teaching in, 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 way, in, in a, but in an educational yeah, exactly. way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Not condescending or anything no. like that. Just um, pull it, bringing them along with you. 
So uh, last question we had. So briefly, uh, there's the, you could probably do a whole podcast on this, but briefly, um, price increases. How do you deal with price increases? At the minute, <laughs> not a lot. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's not that's not true. Um, it's it's been a weird for you guys, hasn't it? And um, it has. I, you know, I don't know what's I don't know what's in store for us in twenty twenty four. Maybe it's going to be twenty five, twenty six before things normalise. So, so we'll see. But I think um, over the years, over the last twelve years, where we've had a brilliant yeah. boom. Um, uh, so, so I think really. Um, again, just from learning over time, it's not just, hey, guys, you're not paying us enough and we're really doing a lot of work for you and can we have more money? Because <laughs> I definitely don't... tried that. Does it work? Yeah. I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that, Chris, but the answer's no. <laughs> yeah, so are we, Chris. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, so I think normally you get, oh, yeah, really sorry to hear that, Chris, but no. Um, uh, so... Which you obviously changed our tack there, and um, yeah. we approach it with data. So we have a, a brilliant um, BI team here that provide all the insight we need to go into these negotiations. So yeah. with some clients, we have commitments in terms of FTEs and hours. With others, we have um, commitments on the performance side. But generally, I would go into one of these discussions and um, have all of the data at my disposal. Normally, I would have a chart to show what we're delivering for them versus what we said we'd deliver for them yeah. um, on a monthly basis. Um, Alongside that, I would show them the wins, the value of our work, and, and obviously the results that are coming out of that. Definitely. Um, and talk about the, the current pacing of, of how things are going. And just just tell them the story of, look, we, we can, of course, do this extra work for you. Like we, we have the resource, we have the capabilities. What we're struggling with right now is the fact that you know we're, we're pacing out this volume where you're paying us 20k and we're delivering 30k worth of work every month so yeah so let's have a discussion on it let's let's see where you really need to lean into in 2024 where you think there are some efficiencies yeah um, and open up the conversation about what they need and want rather than quickly saying we need more money um and and, and open it up and, and see where it goes and that has been really successful for us because the, there isn't a lot of places that they can argue with what i'm saying the data is there and they Correct. feel the service and they can see the wins, but it it puts it back on them to say, "Well, what's your what's your priority and what, where do you want to go?" Chris, I think that's that's kind of a bit of a model answer, really. To be quite frank, I, I wouldn't have anything to add to that. I think that's that's what I've spoken to a number of people about, including people like Jeb Blount, who wrote a book on it called "Price Increases: How to Negotiate Them." But yeah, I think you're spot on. You have to lead with data, Good. and you have to you have to give a logic. And and your evidence point, Chris, is it's working. You know, clients are responding well to that, not just putting out your begging bowl. Yeah. And and the other, like, it's really easy to go, oh, inflation, our staff prices went up. That's not a good reason. No, <laughs> like, it's, it's not. It's true, but it's not a good reason. Um, so we avoid that. We avoid that at all costs. Like, we, be, we never say that. Um, Brilliant. So, yeah. So, Chris, if there's, like, kind of uh, one or two pieces of advice you were going to give to um, agency leaders that are not at 500 people, but they're at kind of 50 people, which is the typical tipping point, 50 to 1, 50, 200. Um, commercially, what would you say to them about how to drive the next phase of growth commercially? Um, so what, one of the... Let me, let me think on this for one second and I'll give you two. What, one of the things that I think we've been really good at over the years is ne never never turning down an opportunity, ne ne never like not speaking to an opportunity and doing it in a really um, productive manner. What, what, ha what I noticed happens in, in the US especially is like marketers move around a lot. Yeah. And if, you're, if you dismiss an opportunity too early and in a rude way, like we don't have time for that, they're too small, you know, da, 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 then those things come back around quite often. And one anecdote from us is that we just landed in the US. We had a client who used to pay us two, three thousand dollars a month and it, it, was, it was all good. And that lady went to be a head market at AMC Networks. Right. And emailed me like, "Hey, would you would you like to work with AMC?" I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> in no time they were paying us two hundred percent more than that. Wow. Uh, sorry, two hundred times, two hundred times more than that. Um, wow. And it's just crazy. Um, so that, so that one is just net. You know, p 
pay it forward, have all of these conversations, make sure you, if you can't work with them, offer them something else, offer them some of your time, offer them some of your yeah. uh, expertise to, to pull them along. And these brands will come back around. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, we have moved from, as I said, our price used to be like $2,000 a month. Yeah. Now it might be like a hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And within that, you need, you need to build really good products within the, the capabilities. So why are you different? Why can you offer something different within paid search that no one else can? And that is really hard. Um, but you, but you need to be thinking about productizing some of your services. You don't have to sell them as products, but how do you differentiate yourself so you can increase those those value conversations from yeah. our minimum fees to be two now it's six and why though why yeah so so that's why I would, that's why I would say brilliant Chris it's been an absolute pleasure I thoroughly enjoyed this it's been really good bit of challenge bit of pushback some really great insights uh, and a bit of fun so Chris thank you ever so much indeed uh, where can people find out more about you please uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I have a Twitter as well. And we can share some of those in the notes. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mike. It's always fun to talk about sales. It is. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for listening to Higgle, the B2B sales club podcast series with your host, Mike Lander. Please subscribe so that you'll catch all the next episodes.